you have far nicer and more discreet headphones than I do. I have the big dopey. I look like I'm. I look like I'm landing a plane in 1939. Oh, don't worry about it. And we're live. So, Fantastic. <laughs> awesome. So welcome to the self-publishing roundtable. This is an extra special bonus with an extra special guest here. This is a short snippet um, of our usual long episodes just because um our guest is so awesome and we'll let him get away with a, a short one <laughs> so today i'm talking with webcomic creator artist writer documentary maker businessman father and husband dave Callett. welcome to the podcast dave well, thank you for having me that was a lovely introduction thank you oh <laughs> <laughs> so um let's get started what you're you're um, primarily a webcomic creator so you, you're known for probably two two web comics. There's Sheldon and there's Drive, and we're mm -hmm. mostly going to be talking about your web comic Drive. So okay. just for those who have no idea who you are and what you do, what is Drive? Sure. Well, um, starting with Drive. So Drive started in 2009, and it was an uh, an offshoot project, not related in any way, but an offshoot project in the sense that. I had been doing my other strip, Sheldon, um, since 1998 online, and I had wanted to try something different. I wanted to do a long form story, and I had had this science fiction, this comedic science fiction idea pop into my head fully formed. So I uh, started on 2009, and it basically takes place ar around uh, in the year 2400, roughly. Um, and it's set in a second Spanish empire. And the idea is that in the midst of a, a, a global depression, um, a alien ship crash lands in the Spanish desert to burn us. And um, one Spanish engineer finds it, uh, retroactively gets to work again. And by holding on to that technology, he at first builds a massive global uh, company and then eventually a global empire and then to a lot, much larger extent, a galactic empire of, of a second Spanish empire. And um, so in that mix though, you find that the, the humans are staring down a war with this race called the Continuum of Makers. And they are the creatures that created this ship, which is a faster than light drive. Um, and they want it back with a, an almost religious fervor. So, um, and then there is a third party that comes into the story towards the end of the, of the first act called the Vin and they are a species that is multi-species, but all share the same virus that they've been infected with, that basically rewrites their personality to what's considered a VIN norm. And um, so these are the three major parties that are set up for what's going to be a tripartite war as the story unfolds. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And um, that that's such a huge, well thought out history and geography of your galaxy, but you said it was fully formed, the idea popped in your head. How did you actually build that fantastic galaxy from the ground up? Oh, that's a great question. Because, you know, stories can start in many different ways. And I've, I've heard authors say that entire stories have been written because they saw a character that had a scar in their mind. And where did that scar come from? And then the whole novel springs from that. Um, in this case, I just knew the largest outline of the story but these years intervening have been me filling it out. Um, so I know where it's going to go. I know what the major movements are in the story. But um, what's been fun is when you know the major way stations you have to hit, like in a car journey, you can still take little journeys along the way to go see this or that. And that's sort of been the way that I've been writing it um, now in its seventh year is that whenever something fun presents itself, it's totally allowable as an author to let myself go do that fun thing in the story as long as I get back to the main way station of the next plot point. So that's the way it's been unfolding. Awesome. And you've mentioned your um, the faster than light drive that you've got there. Now, mm -hmm. we've, we've all, all know that sci-fi is huge on space travel and we've got stargates and warp drives and star drives and hyperdrives. Um, what, what, how did you come up with the, the drive for for this comic and what makes it different from all of the others? That's a great question. Well, the, the, the main centralizing problem for all stories set in space are almost vastly unimaginable dif different distances that one has to travel, which makes anything interesting from a human lifetime 
almost impossible given what we know about space travel and, and the time involved. Mm -hmm. And then there's also the equivalent problem for storytellers of, of uh, uh, you know, as Einstein explained it, the trouble with time travel, basically, as you travel far enough and fast enough uh, and what would happen to things like that. So a lot of different authors have come up with different ways to basically cheat the laws of space and time um, to allow for faster than light travel. And so you have Frank Herbert, positing that that face space could be folded by a navigator so that you could travel point to point across a folded bit of space. Um, you have Star Trek where they create a warp bubble where the ship travels along within a warped space. Um, and I'm trying to think of different ones that I've, we, we've all encountered. But you can, so, uh, and even Star Wars has, uh, I'm forgetting what it was called now, but uh, you, you might remember it where they, I anyway. It was the hyperdrive. Hyperdrive, yeah. They, I didn't want to get in the weeds on that, but yes, <laughs> yes. So I got too much in the weeds on all those. But anyway, the idea for um, for uh, the, the faster than light travel in drive is a, it's a form of Alcubierre drive, which is a, a real uh, theory that actually NASA has, is kind of working on as well, where you create a, uh, a form of... Uh, and what's interesting too is that I designed the ships for drive and they have a very distinctive ring at the back of them. Yeah. And the idea that has only recently come out in the story is what they're doing is they're creating a naked singularity inside that ring. Mm -hmm. And a naked singularity is basically a black hole that's not surrounded by a, um, by a, I'm not boy, my brain is really fried this morning, uh, that's not surrounded by what we would t t determine to be the, the last visual signs of a black hole, you know, the spinning mm -hmm. disc matter falling in. Um, and so with that, they, they basically pinch the space around them. So you're traveling through localized space much faster because it's continually pinching up as though you were a coin traveling across a tablecloth and you're pinching up the tablecloth fabric to travel across much more tablecloth uh, than you would if the tablecloth was all straight and flat. Um, and so the ship is, con the, the naked singularity is constantly gathering up and folding space and pinching space in a localized degree and you're skirting across the crests of folded space, basically. Um, and so it's a version of warp drive. It's a version of Frank Herbert's uh, folded space. The basic idea, like all other authors, is how do you cheat that space-time problem for interesting and compelling space travel? So, uh, But in our story, what's interesting is that uh, one royal family, the Spanish royal family, are the only ones that are allowed access to the drive. They're the only ones that know how to fix it and they keep very tight control on it. So it becomes a form of like what the Saudis do with oil in Saudi Arabia, where you have one royal family that controls the, the seat of power. And, and so any access to that money is controlled through the Saudi royal family. The same is true with the Spanish empire, where the only people that have the means to permit um, and, and fix faster than light travel are the, the royal family of Spain. And so you have a very limited number. It's only a few thousand family members that that maintain this fleet of tens of thousands of ships and so that itself creates problems so um that makes for a fun little a fun little pressure point on the story too is is all the problems that can pop up with that so anyway that i think i meandered pretty far afield from your question oh, there. Sorry no, about I, that. I i think that was great it because you've also said that um a, a lot of the ideas here seem to be grounded in existing circumstances like with the Saudis you mentioned there it's almost like you've you've done what Star Trek has done and and um you're using current events and and um yeah just current events in is existing things to 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 base the the future events and I think it's pretty interesting. yeah it's and, and one of the more interesting aspects that I like about it is that I I like that um especially as an American growing up in what is ostensibly the American century, um, everybody that, or the case would be true with a Victorian growing up in Britain, um, you sort of posit that the future will always be there for your empire, you know? And I like the idea that this is not an Anglo-Saxon empire in the future, and that there are the same patterns for any empire will repeat themselves as it did for the Romans, as it did for the Persians, as it did for the British, as it did for the Americans. And so uh, the Spanish, are once again in, in power and they have all the same human frailties that we all have in terms of uh, uh, jealousy and power and envy and, and greed. And so that's the same eternal human truths, you know?
Yeah, yeah. Speaking of the characters, um, what what about the main characters and drive? How did you come up with them? Was it a matter of this, the drawing uh, influenced the character, or did you come up with the character first and then create? That's a, a great question. Them? That's a that's a great question. Um, some were one way in, in terms of the sketch first and then oh who is this person and then some were i know i need this person let's see what they look like you know and then we'll come up with iterations of it so for example a science fiction strip you always know that you need a captain of your ship um it's just a wonderfully uh uh generic uh, role in in all sci-fi but um so at first it was um essentially a chair ridden uh captain a male captain, uh, and that didn't sit with me at all well. I was like, this doesn't work. This isn't what this story wants or needs. And so then I came up with um, Tennille, who's the, she's, I think she, it hasn't explicitly been said in the strip, but she's roughly 65 um, uh, captain. And for me, what was interesting about that is sci-fi for my money just doesn't have enough older women in command, which is a huge fault of sci-fi, frankly. And, um, and so I like that she was, uh, was tough as nails, but but had a heart, um, and she clearly has uh, a lot of um, heart for another character in the strip called Nosh, who's a very large um, uh, creature called a Vitan, and they come from a very um, massive planet, massive in the sense of uh, the, the density, uh, the gravity is stronger on Vita, and so they're they're not only huge creatures, they're about you know two times the size of a of a. a a jungle gorilla. They are also incredibly strong because their um, their planet is so is so massive um, in terms of gravity. And so um, so he's incredibly strong, but they're pacifists. And anyway, what's nice is kind of semi unspoken in the strip, but they kind of have a motherly son relationship. Um, and so I like that aspect of her is that she is clearly a woman that knows exactly the 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 bad hand she's been dealt by being born where she's been born in this empire that's controlling the technology but she she maneuvers it well and she handles it well and she's super savvy and super cunning but yet also has this uh kind of delightfully sweet relationship with this alien um who in turn thinks of her like a mother so uh she's those are two of my uh, of my favorites and then there's a um there are two other humans on board, Orla, um, who is, uh, as it's been, I don't want to reveal too much about, to, so <laughs> some might read it, but she is a, a woman assigned to the ship by the emperor. Um, and she, it's of uncertain, um, uncertain background of what she's doing truly on there. She's there uh, ostensibly as a xenobiologist, but she's, uh, she's got some other stuff going on. And then there's the youngest member of the crew is the engineer and as I mentioned before the engineers are always come from the royal family so he himself is a royal and has his own problems of where he stands in the royal family as it's slowly coming out in the strip and then there are two other aliens on board uh, one is a very small uh, squirrel slash lizard slash rat type creature very small but he's he uh, has a mohawk which as a sensory organ can see gravity. And so uh, we haven't really talked about in the strip as to why they've evolved that skill, but I have a whole backstory as to why as creatures they've evolved that, that sensory organ. But um, that ability gives him, when tied into ship systems, the ability to steer a ship through faster than light travel in a way that no other species can do. So if humanity can find more of these creatures, then they can ostensibly win the war. So uh, that's, that's his story. And I think that rounds out the cast, uh, mm -hmm. did I forget. Yeah, that's that's good enough for the intro to the <laughs> for folks. I like how you've got a, a lot of the um the common yet very popular tropes for the characters in there. Um, I believe the captain does not like her superior, the emperor. That's that's a very common uh, uh, trait in a in a sci-fi captain to be like slightly against the rules while still managing right. to get their job done and the the pilot who is an unknown but is the empire's last best hope at winning an unwinnable war you you you've got a lot of them in there but you've also turned them on the on their heads these tropes and, and made them your your own are there any others out there that that you have that that you've done that with as well other than the captain and with skitter the pilot um, well, what I like to think that I'm trying to set up in terms of setting tropes on their on their end is that a lot of, especially early sci-fi, 
um, there was definite black and white. There were the, the, the good guys, you know, and it was usually humanity and some invading alien or some. Um, and I'm trying to set up slowly over the course of the, the story that once you get enough of the perspective of any of the warring parties or any of the aliens, that their perspective makes enough sense and is subjectively comp compelling enough where you're like, oh, I see why they're going to war or, oh, I see why they're doing what they're doing. Um, so the idea that there's there's not an objective good or bad uh, you know species in the story, um, and that's not I'm not the first author to do that, but I like I especially compared to early sci-fi, it's a nice thing to move away from. I, I find it more, it's more it's more interesting as a story, I think. Um, mm. And uh, um, I'm trying to think of other tropes that I've moved away from uh, or or play with. Uh, well, I, the, the sort of classic trope is to have the biggest, strongest most powerful character uh be your your heavy so like if it was the fantastic four the thing is going to crush through everything all the time or if you're the avengers you're always going to send the hulk in to break something up and i like the fact that my biggest strongest uh heavy in the strip uh, nosh the character we were talking about before um rarely if ever will lift a finger against anybody he's a pacifist so you have ostensibly a great street brawler that never wants to street brawl and i i enjoy that it's more it makes for more fun situations you know um it's like being a cowboy with a pistol at your side and the guy is like no i don't i never want to shoot this thing uh so it's uh it makes for more interesting storylines so anyway that's a that's a fun trope to play with yeah um, do you have time to talk uh, a bit about business here? Or... Sure, yeah, yeah, we'll get, yeah absolutely. Um, go ahead. So you're, our two creative industries have something in common. They've both gone through a digital disruption. Can you be, briefly explain how that happened for comics? Sure. Um, well, in the United States and Canada, for almost exactly 100 years, um, Newspaper comic strips were huge, the huge heavy hitters of the genre. Uh, and then as the century went on, comic books, you know, the sort of superhero books uh, came about. And the, the business model for comics in the U.S. and Canada was what's uh, known here as a syndication model, where um, you would have one artist working in any city in the U.S. and Canada. They would send their material to a syndicate, usually in New York or Chicago or Toronto. And then that company would send it out to thousands of newspapers across the U.S. or to Canada. And back in the day... New York would have 10 newspapers, Chicago would have six newspapers, San Francisco would have four newspapers, and even small towns would always have two newspapers in the US. And so it was this great market because you could play one newspaper off the other on who you're going to sell to. And uh, the resulting money created multi, 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 multi millionaires like um, Charles Schultz of Peanuts or, or Jim Davis of Garfield or you know, even lesser cartoonists in the American and Canadian market were making millions, if not tens of millions. So it was a great income source. But as you know, uh, um, print, uh, especially newsprint, suffered just a huge blow. And then the, the recession sort of was the last nail in the coffin. And so for people that do, wanted to do what I want to do, which is be a comic strip cartoonist, that whole avenue dried up. So it was like training all your life to become a professional athlete and then the league folds and you're like, well, where do I go? That was the league. There's no stadium anymore. I don't know where to play the game. And thankfully for us, the, the web uh, came about just in time. And for the first few years, it was kind of a halting process because so many of the financial uh, pathways that you or I take for granted now weren't around in 1998 or 2002 or 2006. But, um, the basic structure of, of the business as it's come to be is that I create my comic strips. I put them out for free on the web. Um, those are either uh, ad supported. So there's ads around the website or on the emails or that kind of thing. Um, and then folks that really love the, the comics will uh, either uh, buy the original art or buy a book collection of the comics or buy a t-shirt or some um, swag uh, that are, you know, represent the comic in some way, shape or form, anything from a plush toy to, to a bumper sticker for your car. And then, um, oh, oh, look at that. <laughs> that's, that's one of my characters from Sheldon. That's awesome that you have that. And then, um, and then, uh, and then occasionally it'll be like an, an occasional comic book show or a comic convention or a pop culture convention and um, an extension of those kind of book and t-shirt sales. And so that's the basic model. And then, 
even more so in the last few years, a couple additional uh, monetary pathways have come about. And the two big ones for cartoonists like myself are uh, Kickstarter, which I'm sure you're familiar with, mm -hmm. and Patreon, which a lot of your listeners might be less familiar with. But um, the two basic ideas for that is that both are distributed fundraising by fans of a piece of work for that piece of work. And the idea for the most part with both is that don't give a lot of money Let's just have a lot of people give very small amounts of money. Very, you know, ideally the smallest amount of money you can give, but we get tens of thousands of people to do it. That's sort of the, the platonic ideal of what the, how they work. So for Kickstarter, it's it's usually one item. Like, hey, I'm I'm kickstarting to raise money to make this coffee, uh, but it's going to be solid brass. And so if everyone can chip in, we're going to make this solid brass coffee. And um, and so that's a project-based system. And then what Patreon said is, hey, there's a lot of artists that, that's great, Kickstarter's great. There's a lot of artists, though, that work on a continuing basis where they're constantly making music videos or podcasts about self-publishing or, um, or comic strip creators or poets or playwrights. And they iterate, and it's constant, it's constant um, new material, but it's on a smaller basis. And so Kickstarter wouldn't work for that. And so Patreon says, hey, instead of giving uh, $10 for this one large lump sum event, I'll give a few pennies for every iteration of this longer form of art. Um, and those two have been incredible because it's good both for the fan and reader and it's good for the artist because no artist wants to say, um, all I need is, is a Renaissance uh, fa Italian family to come in and sponsor my fresco paintings and then I'm set. It's so much more fulfilling to say, no, if everybody just does a quarter, it's literally one-tenth of a cup of coffee and, and the artist can make a living and you can go through your day with a smile on your face because you contributed to the art form and, and supported the artist. And um, it's, a, it's a lovely idea and, it's, and when it works, when it is executed well, it works really well. So I'm actually really encouraged by it because I personally hate the advertising model. And as more and more viruses get into advertising uh, and Trojans, it's like it's it's so much better to move away from that. So, anyway, that's the very long answer to your very short question about the monetary uh, structure of how how a web cartoonist works. Well, you managed to answer a few of my questions in one go. So oh, good. All right. Well, that's time. Good. That's great. That's great. <laughs> so I noticed. I noticed. I'm just gonna take a sip of my solid bronze coffee here for a second. Yeah. 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 I'm glad we kickstarted that. That was great. <laughs> So I noticed that when you were talking about Kickstarter and Patreon, you mentioned um, the fans. So it's it doesn't sound like it's an option for people just starting out. It sounds like an option for people who already established themselves a little bit so that they have the fans there to kick in and, and provide sure. some money. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Yeah, there's definitely... Um... And it's it's not unlike really every career path in life is that you a little bit have to earn your well, there's a phrase for that earn your stripes I don't know what the phrase maybe earn your stripes is the phrase but you have to you have to put in your time you know and um, however I often tell cartoonists there is no harm in putting uh, your things up on the online for free for on the web and maybe starting a Patreon page because you never know the one reader that in in a completely separate geographical location that loves your work. And conversely, you might have one cousin or uncle or aunt who really wants to support you, and they'll give you a dollar a month, you know, that kind of thing. And it's encouraging even to just have that one or two people that believe in you and and are willing to support you. So um, the most important thing, though, in all of that, before you do anything monetarily, is the work itself. So to either create that poem or create the comic or create the play or the podcast. And then once it's up there, once you start feeling uh, like you're getting your footing, then the money can start to broach into the conversation, you know. Mm, awesome. I have one last question for you, if that's sure. okay. Yeah. So web comics come and go, and there are a lot of them that go. Some of them don't even last a month. So what do you put your success and long longevity down to? Oh, that's a great question. Um, since I was eight or nine years old, I always wanted to be a cartoonist. And uh, for good or bad, I structured most of my young adult and adult life towards becoming a cartoonist. And that is, for me, it has been nothing but a good thing because so many people in their 30s and 40s and 50s are still like, I don't know what I want to be when I grow up, you know, but I always knew what I wanted to be when I grew up. So um, I, 
a lot of it was just stick to it in this and just knowing that this was what I wanted to do, knowing that this was my passion. And uh, you'll know it's the thing you're meant to do when you will give up watching TV and f to do that instead at 11 o'clock at night, or you will, you will give up video games or hanging out with friends or granted, you don't want to become a hermit, but the idea being that you find so much joy in it and there's so much satisfaction and you know that you want to do it. And the, the impetus is there to do it. When that's there, you'll find a way to make it work. And it may take you five years. It may take you seven years. In fact, I can almost guarantee you it'll take you five to 10 years to sort of figure it out and get your footing. But um, if it's something that you love to do, the journey and the process of getting there is a joy in and of itself. So when you find, uh, when the love is there, even without the money, then when the money comes, it's just gravy. It's, it's wonderful, you know, but, uh, for me, the, the stick to itiveness and the lasting power of doing Sheldon and drive comes from, I love to do it. And there's a small part of me that would do it even if no one saw it and there was no money and I was doing it for myself just because I love the physical act of drawing. And I love this particular way of writing with words and pictures. Um, so uh, I think that's why I've been lucky enough to stick around with web comics. Mm, that's awesome. So much of what you've said has just resonated with me as a self-published writer. Yeah. And yeah. And, and you're so inspiring too and knowledgeable. It's, it's been a joy talking with you, Dave. Oh, well, you are, you are wonderful to speak with. Thank you so much. <laughs> it, it, I know that you, I, I think I had to wake you up at four in the morning, your time to, 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 <laughs> to find a reasonable time where we could both meet. I'm sorry. The, the, the world is where it is, where we're on opposite sides of the globe, but I really thank you for the time today. It was really nice chatting with you. Oh, thank you very much. And it was seven in the morning, not four. Oh, in the seven. Morning. Okay. Even I was trying I to set you up for an even, even better heroin <laughs> position there, but they already know I wouldn't get up at four in the morning from <laughs> the interview, so. Well, to be fair, she got up at seven, everyone. And that's come on. It's Saturday. Come on. Today, <laughs> today that, that is true. That is true. It's a Saturday. I would not be up at seven. Uh, anyway. <laughs> Well, thank so you, I want you to know I will be thinking of you tomorrow morning for me uh, <laughs> at 7 a.m. when I am still in my PJs and not at all getting out of bed. <laughs> I will sleep in tomorrow. Don't worry. Good, 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 <laughs> I'll good. be up at lunchtime. That they <laughs> so um, just quickly, Dave, where can people find you online? Oh, okay. Uh, well, if the URLs get lost, you can either do a very quick search for Sheldon or Drive. And most often, I think I'll, I'll be on the first page for both of those. Um, but uh, for Sheldon, it's Sheldon Comics, all one word, dot com. And somewhat confusingly, the other one is Drive Comic, uh, singular, dot com. I, I don't remember why or how that happened. But anyway, we all make our choices in life, and then we have to live with them for the rest of our lives on podcasts when we explain the URL. <laughs> Oh, and then I guess as a third method, if you haven't seen it yet, I believe it's on Netflix where you are. Uh, I have a documentary called Strip that should be on Netflix if you have, if you have um, although oddly it doesn't appear in some countries. They bought the worldwide rights to it, but I don't know why certain countries they didn't put it up. I don't, I don't know. I haven't asked Netflix why, but so Strip is a comic strip documentary on, uh, on comics and kind of wonderfully it features the first ever interview with Bill Watterson of Calvin and Hobbes. So uh, that one's worth checking out. And, and that's it. That's all. That's all my main projects. Yeah, that's you've got a lot. I mean, seriously, oh, I've been following you for like over ten years now. Really? So, oh, yeah. that's delightful. Yeah, and then yeah, you've you've you're always doing something. You're very. I guess you. We would put you up there with one of our very highest prolific um, writers who produces a lot. You're, oh wow. You do seem to be out there. Ex to be fair, though, except for tomorrow morning at 7 a.m. where I will, not, <laughs> I will not be doing anything. So <laughs> that's my that's my one. Awesome. Thank you. For those who are listening and would like to check out more information about Dave or about the self-publishing roundtable, just go to our website, selfpublishingroundtable.com. Thank you for listening. Bye.